My friends, hello. Welcome back to more Oxygen Not Included tutorials. This one's a interesting one. I've actually been kind of excited to do this one for a little while. This one's going to be all about uh, geysers, vents, volcanoes, how, whatever you want to call them. They're all basically the same thing. They're basically natural structures that are going to produce renewable resources for you. Um, and that kind of transitions us into the first point that I really want to make, which is why these are important and why you want to look out for them. Um, if you take a look at the map that you spawn on, you'll notice that all of this stuff is not reproducing. So all this water that I have, which by the way, this is a lot of water for one of these starting maps. This would be a great seed for somebody wanting to uh, start their own run on it. By the way, if you want it, here you go. Go ahead and freeze frame that. But uh, anyway, so the idea that I have here is all this stuff is not reproducing. So this water that I have, this is finite. And the amount of water that is naturally on the map and naturally occurring on the map is finite. Uh, same thing goes for any materials, like sand and uh, metal and all that kind of fun stuff. Same thing goes for like power resources. Uh, there's other ways you could actually get a lot more power and that is by finding these vents and volcanoes and geysers and all that fun stuff too. By the way, just change them all to geysers. Like. I, there's no reason to have the two different words. All right. But yeah, so that's the whole reason you'll want to look out for them. So if you've watched any of my other videos that are about uh, effectively anything that requires exploring the map, I'm going to tell you this a lot. Get out on the map and explore as much as you possibly can. I'm totally pressing the wrong buttons here. I want to go to options and turn on the sandbox mode here. Here I'm, I was like literally thinking as I was saying this, oh, I'm going to be slick and actually get us into sandbox mode while continuing on my point. And, here I go, totally making a mockery out of that. Anyway, uh, if you've watched any of my other videos before, you'll know that I tell you to dig around a lot. And the geysers and volcanoes and vents and stuff like that is one of the biggest reasons why. So that you can eventually become fully renewable, fully sustainable off of the things that you are consuming. Because things like this will just produce it for free. And things like this, uh, which it's not revealed yet, but I looked at this earlier and I know it's down here. Here we go. Uh, things like this will produce water for you for free. This is something that is actively reproducing. So capturing these things is a big deal. We're going to be talking a little bit about some of the mechanics involved with this. And then we're actually going to talk about how to capture every single one. So we'll go through the whole list. I'll uh, probably skip maybe a couple of them that are kind of redundant. Because you don't necessarily need to know how to set up two of them that are really similar. Like metal volcanoes, for example. Uh, but yeah. Oh. Something else I should also say as a caveat here is that this is not necessarily the most like hyper-optimized way to capture a lot of these things. These are just going to be very simple ways to do it and ways to kind of get you thinking about how to improve it on your own. If you have more efficient setups than something I'm about to do here, then that's great. This is mostly aimed at people that have never done something like this before, so uh, yeah. not def Definitely not trying to advertise myself as like, this is the most efficient, hyper-optimized way to do something like this. It's just to show you the basics of them if you've never done this before. So, what I want to talk about first is let's talk about uh, some stats that are actually on these, which is right here. And you can see the temperatures that things spawn at, the quantity that it spawns, you can see how much it's erupting uh, in a given period, and then you'll see an active period which requires analysis. The basics of this eruption period and this active period are that these are not erupting all the time, they're irregular. Um, and it means that uh, you'll need to analyze this to actually know the full picture of that. So let me turn this on real quick to my cheats. And there you go. Once you have it uh, analyzed, if I re-click on this, and it should update, there we go. You can see that the uh, active and dormant periods are roughly half and half. It's 66 active cycles every 126 cycles. It'll tell you when it's going to be dormant the next time. Then you can tell whether this is something that you can uh, expect to erupt soon with the material or whether you need to wait a little while. And if you really want to, you can do some calculations on how much this will actually produce on average. There's also online tools for that too. So what I would say here is that if you're ever trying to capture one of these things, and I'll try to make sure to note this when we're capturing each individual one, is that you need to know when the uh, dormant periods are or at least keep an eye out for them. If you click on it, it'll tell you whether it's in its idle or dormant period. Uh, dormant means it's not going to do anything. Idle means that it will erupt soon. And you can see that I have a timer on there that tells me when after I've analyzed it. But the point that I'm getting at is that a lot of the material that comes out of here is very hot. And if you have your duplicates down trying to capture something while it's erupting, that could either erupt into your base and cause a mess, or that could hurt or kill your duplicates. 
So yeah, don't mess around with some of these things if they are really hot. And you can see all the temperatures here, which I've finally re-enabled my mod because it kept getting disabled from switching back and forth from the DLC, but I mean, I was being lazy, let's be honest about it. Uh, there's also sneak preview at a video that's going to be coming out about this soon. Um, I'll just leave it at that. All right, so what I'm going to encourage is to, again, get out on the map, try to find these things, because some of them are very important for your survival, and some of them will also help you kind of get into the later phases of the game. More importantly, you will need renewable water, and that's one of the biggest reasons to go find these things. Some of them are revealed. Some of them look like this. You can see the chlorine geyser up here as well, or vent, or whatever it's called. Just name them the same thing. Uh, <laughs> but some of them are not. So what you might notice at the bottom of every single one of these geysers or volcanoes or vents or whatever are these four tiles of neutronium. Neutronium is something that you just can't... Well, I have my cheats on. You're not supposed to be able to do that. <laughs> Let me turn this back off. <laughs> I'm like, you can't dig through it. Look at this. Uh, let me try to get this back to where it was. Okay, there we go. If you were, if you have your cheats off, which I didn't and totally messed that up, if you try to dig through this, you'll get these messages that you cannot actually dig these out. They're basically indestructible tiles unless you have some cheating tool on. So if you're going to be looking out for those, that means wherever you see a pattern like this, there's very likely a geyser or a vent or a volcano on top of it. So let's simulate as if we were expanding out our base a little bit and kind of digging around and we happen to notice that. And oh, there's one right here. So if you look at this, you can see, okay, there's something behind here. You could do this one of two ways to actually figure out what this is. You could start digging in there, but the scary thing about that is you don't necessarily know what it is. So if you happen to unearth a volcano that you're not ready to deal with yet, now you have magma in your base and that's pretty bad. So a trick you can use for this is if you go into priority, you can see that there actually is a priority here because that's the priority that we'll be analyzing something at. And if you were to set this to the top priority and do this, you'll get an alert of saying that this is now a top priority to research this. That's not very valuable in itself, but what it does give you is it tells you exactly what that is. So if you hover over this yellow alert, now I know without even digging this out that this is an iron volcano. So if I were just to go in there willy-nilly and be like, Yeehaw, let's go dig out a volcano. Uh, that might turn out really bad for me. So this is definitely a trick to let you know what's there. Then I'll usually change it to some other priority to let me know that I've seen it before, like that. So, uh, yeah, get out on the map, try to discover these things, and then once you do, this is where the meat of the video is going to be, let's start capturing these things. Um, I'm going to cheat this just a bit. Uh, for some reason, I don't like deleting every dupe that I have, so... We'll make sure to babysit them a little bit, but uh, I'm going to dig out a big part of the map so that we have a place to kind of play around in our sandbox. So, let's just go ahead and destroy a whole bunch of stuff. Definitely getting some pretty weird effects. Might be what happens when you try to destroy stuff when the game isn't paused, because I usually do it when it is paused. Alright, let's reveal a whole bunch of stuff, and there we go. Now we have a nice canvas area for us to work in, and I can go ahead and spawn these things using a fancy debug tool. So, here we go. So, I'm just gonna go through these one at a time. We're gonna talk about how to capture every single one. And again, this is not gonna be a hyper-optimized way to do it. This is just gonna be a basic way. If you have better ways to do some of this stuff, then that's that's awesome. Uh, if you, you can definitely suggest any better setups here for people that wanna be hyper-optimized. But this is gonna be more so aimed around a uh, basic understanding of them. So, Let's go ahead and grab a cool steam geyser, or cool steam vent, whatever. I'm going to pause, we're going to drop it down here, clear my selection. So this is the one we were just looking at before, by the way, they're both the same thing. I'm just going to capture it out here in the open since it's easier for us to see. So first thing you need to solve with this cool steam vent is that uh, what's going to be erupting here is steam, meaning that if I want to turn this into water, I need a way to cool it. This was something that I actually struggled with quite a bit as a new player because I kept trying a bunch of different solutions that didn't work very well. Um, a lot of them were based out of Wheeze Warts, but I think a better solution is something like this. So what I would probably do is, and by the way, I'm going to be using Igneous Rock for any insulated tile that I put around this. Um, so if you're looking for a good material to use, I would say Igneous Rock is great. If you happen to be manufacturing ceramic, that's even better. But those were the two winners that we had from the uh, which material is best for insulation uh, video that I put out a little while ago. So what I would do is I'd build a small area around this, maybe something that looks like this. 
And I would leave some space up here, so if you need a place for your duplicates to work and walk and stuff like that, you could put a ladder. And make a chamber that's kind of bigger than it needs to be. The reason why is because uh, all of these vents and geysers and volcanoes, they will stop erupting if they are too clogged up. So if there's too much steam or too much gas in here, they will stop erupting, which means that I'm not getting the free resource that I otherwise would. So I'd build something like this. Um, you can vacuum out the air or not. It's actually better to not most of the time because you kind of want that to be a little bit of a buffer. So whatever gas happens to trickle in there, I'd probably just leave it there. Um, so let's go ahead and fill this up with regular oxygen at like one kilogram per tile. There we go. This is going to start erupting. So now we need to build a, a section of this that's entirely about cooling it. And there's a couple of different solutions you can use here. And I'm just going to use one that I would typically use in a bunch of other runs. We're just going to have this set up over here for a whole bunch of different reasons. And that is having some kind of cooled liquid that you maintain yourself. Um, so for now, I'm just going to spawn polluted water. I'm going to spawn it at a low temperature. So in Fahrenheit, this is about 40. In Celsius, this is maybe like 6. It's, it's pretty low. We'll be able to see it here in just a second when I mouse back over it. Yeah, 5.6. Pretty good estimate. You can cool this with using a lot of ways. You can use polluted ice. Uh, you can put it actually inside the physical ice biome itself. But the best thing is going to be to use aqua tuners and steam turbines. Uh, I have a whole video about that kind of stuff if you want to know about it. But this is something that I usually use around a whole bunch of different places, just as a general coolant to uh, help things be cold when I want them to be cold. So this is what I'm going to circulate to actually cool this stuff down. So what I would typically have in a big pit like this is I would have a whole bunch of pumps and they would all be leading out to different places. So I'd be using some insulated pipe. Again, igneous rock is the most accessible uh, one, at least material. Then what I would do is once it got to this room, I would make this out of either radiant pipes or regular pipes. Um, the regular pipes would probably be a little bit better in this scenario, only because they're going to have a little bit higher capacity for it. Let's double check. Let me check out the couple of resources that I think are better for this type of thing. So what we're looking for here is the heat capacity. It's pretty bad on obsidian, also pretty bad on sedimentary rock. Actually, the radiant pipe might be a little bit better, so let's just use that instead. Let's go ahead and throw some radiant pipe in here, and I would just snake it through something like this. You don't want it to go all the way through because you still need a place to actually pump out the water that you're about to condense, but this is this is good enough. Um, at some point, I would also throw a liquid shot off toward the end, maybe something like this. And this liquid shut off is only going to activate when the water in here is too hot. So I'll show you that automation really quickly here. Again, I have a lot of videos about this stuff in, in depth and in detail, but I'll try to go uh, at a reasonable pace to both keep this video kind of shorter, but also not leave a bunch of people in the dust if they've never seen this before. So I'd have a, a loop that's set up something like this. Uh, I'm gonna drop a power source that's a cheater power source, so it's nothing super special. Um, and then I would run some cable over here into the liquid shutoff. And I'm going to wait to put the pump in here. You'd want the pump to already be in there before this thing was erupting. So this is going to be one of those that you definitely want to capture while it's dormant. But since we don't have the luxury of waiting for that to happen, and I don't think there's a way to force it in debug, um, I'm just going to be doing it all at once. So uh, once we have this hooked up, coolant will be pumped into here. And using this liquid shut off, we now need to have some automation to say when the coolant is too hot and to flush it out and give me more. So what I would do for this is I would probably put one of two things you can do. Uh, you could either put a thermo sensor up in the air to have it flush when it gets too hot. But I kind of want to flush it whenever the water inside the pipe is too hot. So I'm going to grab a liquid pipe thermo sensor. And that's just going to detect the temperature of water in the pipes. And I probably want to put it somewhere near the actual geyser itself. So maybe like right here, I want to grab uh, automation wires and run it from there into another thing, which is called a buffer gate. This buffer gate keeps this signal green for a long time so that we flush the whole room of water. So we get brand new cold water for all of the pipes rather than just some of them. And then I would run it down into the shutoff. Something like this. So um, I'm going to talk about the second part here pretty soon because the second part should be pretty obvious. We need a water pump to pump it out, but we'll worry about that in a bit. By the way, um, the stuff that you put in here, make sure that it can resist temperature that is going to be of the like 
higher than the temperature that's listed here. So at maximum, this room is going to be 230 or 110 Celsius. I want to make sure I'm building stuff that will be able to resist that kind of heat. So this shutoff has a heat overheat temperature of 257 or 125 Celsius, so I'll be fine there. When I build my pump, I'm going to pay attention to that too. But let's get the coolant in here. By the way, I'm going to set this buffer gate to last for about 30 seconds. That'll give it time for the whole room to flush. And let's go ahead and start sending it in. So if we look at the overlay, the uh, water, the cooled water more specifically, and the cooled polluted water more specifically is going to be making its way in here. And it's going to be flowing down. I need to make sure to also set my thermo sensor. I want to flush this out when the water in here is too hot. Let's say 150 Fahrenheit, which it doesn't update here uh, because of the mod. Let's see what it updated to in Celsius. Oh, I probably need to let it run. Oh, this is the current temperature. Okay. 150 Fahrenheit, uh, doing some really crappy rough math. I want to say that's probably like 65 Celsius, something like that. Uh, but yeah. So we have cold liquid flowing in here, and that's going to be what actually condenses this down into water and does it reliably. At first, your insulated tile and whatever gas is there will help out with this, but this is the long-term solution to help this pump out. So now that I've got this up, you can also add a couple of other things if you really want to, like these temp shift plates, just to help absorb a little bit of temperature. But for the most part, this should be okay. Uh, this is ultimately going to be your coolant anyway. The uh, temp shift plate would just be there to help share temperature a little bit better. Maybe you could get some cooling from the water that's already condensed if you wanted to. There's a bunch of different things you could do here. Oh, since I feel bad for these guys, I need to babysit them a little bit. So <laughs> let's let's give them some outhouses. They don't have to sit in their own filth. Uh, let's give them some dirt. There we go. All right, of course, the last thing you need to place a pump down. I'd probably make this out of something that has a high enough overheat temperature to deal with it. So gold amalgam is one of the better things because it's really accessible. I just drop it in there like that. I would use some automation on this as well to make sure I'm only pumping water out if there's enough water to justify running this pump. I don't want to run the pump if there's basically nothing to pump, otherwise I'm just wasting power. So I'd probably drop in something like this and say that I only want to pump stuff out if we're above, let's say, like 800 kilograms on that tile. And then I would just hook it up to the pump itself and then pump it out somewhere. Since this is going to be very hot water, I'm going to continue to use uh, the insulated pipes with the materials that are good for insulation. So I'm just going to start leading this over into a room that we drop all of our hot water in for the time being. And again, I, I feel like... I feel like I have to say this now because um, somebody was really bothered in one of my videos that I was not setting things up very like economically and being kind of sloppy about stuff. I'm just going to say that I'm doing this for the sake of speed, so this will be a little bit sloppy in how I set some of this stuff up. Um, also, we need power. And the stuff I'm going to be sloppy about is usually the stuff that we're not really focusing on. Any of this is very deliberate. So there we go. Now we have a full loop happening here. Uh, this will continue to erupt once the water gets too hot, which we'll just simulate this really quickly. Um, I would keep this at like 150 or somewhere about there, but if the water got too hot in that pipe, I would set it down to, or rather, whatever. Let me just turn this on. <laughs> so once it gets too hot, it will flush all of the water out because you will then be activating the shutoff to allow flow to happen back to this tank. So this tank will warm, but you want to have other things that are continually cooling this as well. And then eventually, once we are like, okay, the water is now sufficiently cold enough now that it's coming back in here, this will run for a little bit longer because of this buffer gate to assure that we get a full flush out of here, and then it will stop once again. So the, the liquid that's sitting up here in these pipes is basically absorbing all of the heat from the steam that comes out, and then condensing that steam down into something that we can use. So that's a cool steam vent. Um, as far as practicality goes, this is one of my least favorite water options. We'll get to much better water options here in just a bit. All right, let's talk about regular steam vents, which I need to find. Here we go. So regular steam vents are gonna look something like this. I wanna make sure to pause for not just erupting hot steam into our base. This comes out and you might notice that, oh, but didn't we just talk about a steam vent? Yes, we did. This is called a quote unquote cool steam vent. And I say quote-unquote because steam is still extremely hot, not something you want to mess around with in, with your dupes or sending it into your base or something like that. 
but comparatively to the other vent, it's very cool. So I'm just going to start talking in Celsius terms because everybody asked me to. 110 Celsius on the uh, cool steam vent. On the regular steam vent, though, 500. It's very hot. So you really can't mess around with this one especially. And there is a good way to deal with this. I'll show you how. So what I would do, first of all, we're going to go through this in phases as well because you kind of need to go through this in couple steps. So I'd probably reserve some space. And a little bit of a spoiler alert, we're going to be placing steam turbines on the top of this to generate power from this. So this is a power generating one. It's a little bit of a water generating one, but it's not that good. So this one, since it comes out so hot, if I can afford ceramic, I would probably use it here. This is one of the better ones to use ceramic on because 932 degrees Fahrenheit or 500 Celsius is really, really hot. And that will eventually heat up anything that's touching it. So definitely don't want to mess around with that too much. All right, so I'm gonna use ceramic here. I'm gonna place some tiles kind of close to the top of this. And I'm going to very critically say to do this while this is not erupting, otherwise this really messes up the build. Let's drop some steam turbines here. The focus of the steam turbines is they will uh, suck up the steam and generate power from it. And they will give off a little bit of water. So if you've never seen that before, that's what they do. I'm gonna encase these in their own little room as well, something like this. Then I'm gonna encase the geyser. Uh, sure, that's fine to go this far over. I'll delete the excess. It will be repurposed in later batches. Um, and then I'm going to try... So I should do this for real, actually. What I would typically do here is I would get a gas pump. It can be steel or it can be something else. Whatever it is, it's eventually going to overheat, and that's okay. Because we, before this thing erupts, we want to make sure this entire room is vacuumed out and has nothing in it. Because if you don't, there's a potential that these will get blocked up by excess gases that are getting in the way of these uh, inlets for the steam turbine. So you definitely want to vacuum this out. So I'm just going to pretend to do it here since I can't play, otherwise more steam is going to come out. Also make sure to set this up on automation so that once it's done, you can turn it off and keep it off. So I do something like this. You can also set this to a high pressure gas vent because you should have plastic by now if you are building steam turbines. This is just to assure that it can vent and it's not going to get blocked up by anything. Like uh, too much pressure. Let's drop another uh, cheater power supply here. So we're going to have something like this. I'm not going to let this play because again this is putting out steam and I want it to be going into the turbines. Let's just pretend that this is ran for a while and we have vacuumed out the whole room. Once you get to that point, your whole room should just be nothing but vacuum, like this. There should be no gases in there, so that the only gas that's actually in there is the steam when this thing erupts. Now what you'll want to do is, of course, have these steam turbines above. They need to be uh, set on top of tiles like this, and then the inlets are actually below the tile. It'll suck up the steam, it'll give you power, but there's a couple of things you need to hook up first. Um, these will put out water. Specifically, very hot water because it's condensing down to like the hottest temperature that water can be. And then because this is water, I can just send it back into that same pool of stuff that I have. There have also been cases where I don't necessarily want the water from this and it's close to space. I'll just vent it out into space if I don't care. Alright, so that's good. We should also note that these will generate power. You can see how much they will power or how much they will generate if they're at full power. So you do something like this. I'll usually, and you can do this uh, in a couple of different ways, but I will usually create a block with a heavy watt wire here so that I can have this come back out and connect to my batteries somewhere. So I'll do something like that. So this is generating power for me as long as the steam vent is on. And this will generate, you know, these numbers. So it'll generate an okay amount of power. It's not amazing. Uh, this in combination with a whole bunch of other geysers can really give you a strong power base over time though. Now, one thing about this is that we still need cooling. These steam turbines are still going to generate heat. And there are some builds out there that will allow you to cool this room using the water that this thing generates. It's a little bit exploity, and I feel like it can be very hard for a newer player to get stabilized. So I'm not going to show that way. I'm going to show the way that I typically will do it, and that is just to cool it the same way that we're doing up here. So what I would usually do is I would have a high pressure gas vent and that would be leading into, um, or rather what would be coming out of this would be hydrogen. I'm probably going to put this down here actually now that I'm thinking about the setup a little bit more. The reason that I want hydrogen in here is because hydrogen will conduct heat the best. So that will be, oh I should probably just be filling it up with hydrogen. That'll be the most effective thing to both absorb the temperature that comes off of here. 
but also make sure we keep these things nice and cool so they don't shut down. Um, if it ever gets too hot, and by the way, I would put a ton in here, maybe like, you know, 10 kilograms or something like that. Um, so I'd put a whole bunch of hydrogen in here, super overpressurize it with this high pressure gas vent. Um, and then I would run the coolant lines in here as well. I feel like I cut myself off at an earlier point. I don't remember what I was saying, so <laughs> sorry about that. But yeah, I would just run the same lines that I have from up here. So we need an inlet, or rather we need something to just grab off of this line. And I'm going to be kind of messy here. I'd probably be better about this in a real base, but we're trying to be fast. So I'd probably just do something like this. And then once we got down to the entry point, switch over to the radiant tiles once again. And you can actually just build like a bridge or something like that. So you can go over the actual outlets. And then you can kind of just snake it in here. There's a bunch of different patterns that you can do. Uh, it doesn't have to be perfect. But you want to get it so that you leave the last couple spaces for... Uh, the the exhaust here. So I've only left myself a couple spaces meaning that I need to actually connect this and then Destroy the other excess ones. There we go So this is my line that's going in with coolant. We're gonna set up the exact same way with this liquid shutoff So I'm gonna just go ahead and place this like that and uh, This is again gonna be hooked up to the same type of automation so you can use whatever you want out of here I Actually made this room too small. Let's make this a little bit bigger then you want to hook it up to some kind of automation, so the automation can just be something like this, like a thermo sensor, if you just want to check the temperature of the room, which is totally fine for this. Same deal as before, uh, set up a buffer gate, just to let the whole room flush before we uh, tell this uh, liquid shutoff to turn off. This liquid shutoff you can also hook up to your heavy watt wire as well, because you should be generating power from this steam, so that's pretty handy. Um, and then we need an outlet, and we need to send it back to our cooling pit. So here we go. Again, just being kind of messy. And then back into the line that takes the coolant, which is this one. Okay. So, I'm going to set this up to be, if it's above, say, like, some kind of room temperature-ish type of temperature, because then that will make it not overheat my base too much around me. We'll do something like that. If it's ever over 80 degrees Fahrenheit, I will flush the room. And again, we need to set this to a little bit higher to allow the whole room to flush. So we'll do that. All right, once we unpause this, we can see that the steam turbines are generating power. There you go, 850 watts. And they will generate about as much as the steam uh, vent puts out. You need to be careful with this though because this will overpressurize as well. Sometimes you can get away with only two, sometimes you need three depending on how fast the steam comes out. So you may have to go back and add another one here or you could have just started with three. Uh, but yeah, so they will be working as hard as they can. And by the way, this will overheat, which is fine. I'm not going to use it anymore. I only needed it to get the initial gas out of there. And if we check this out, the, the place that, or the time in which this starts to back up and not uh, emit steam anymore is five kilograms per tile. Looks like we might just barely be okay with these two. So we should be fine. So these things, like I mentioned, they will produce a tremendous amount of heat, which is what the coolant is for. And in the meantime, let's take a look at our plumbing. The water that's getting condensed from the steam is going out of the steam turbines and into our normal pit of water right here. The coolant has already come in, it's settled in its pipes, and it's just going to be chilling there, cooling these things off for a while. And when the room gets too hot, the room will get flushed, which is happening a lot faster than the other ones. Let's just set this to a lower temperature, just so that uh, we can demonstrate this a little bit. Now I've set it to, if this room is over 70 degrees Fahrenheit, or it looks like roughly 20-ish Celsius, maybe a little bit uh, more than that, then it will flush. So let's watch that happen in the automation. It will say it's too hot, it's going to send it through the buffer gate, and it's going to tell this shutoff to turn on. The shutoff is going to allow water flow until it tells it to turn off, which is when this buffer gate expires, and after this thermo sensor says, all right, we're not too hot anymore, so once this buffer gate runs out, there we go, the shutoff will turn off, and flow will stop. So the cool water will just sit in the air, it'll continually cool this hydrogen, and you'll be good. So that's how you capture a steam vent. Uh, like I said, it's useful for power, maybe a little bit of water. In that last run, that's as much water as we got, so... I don't know, not a tremendous amount, but still not too bad. So we're good on that. Alright, let's move on to some of the easier water sources. Let's talk about just a regular water geyser. These things are, these things are awesome. 
And I'm going to probably only show one of a few of these. So, uh, well, no, let's go through them all. Whatever. So water geyser is very straightforward. It's going to produce hot water, 95 degrees Celsius, 203 Fahrenheit. It's going to produce a lot more than the other things, by the way. So 15.9 kilograms a second. Just by comparison, this produces like insanely less than that, like 60 times less almost. So uh, the amount of water that you're going to get out of something like this is way higher than you're going to get out of something like this or this. This one is only 4,000 grams per second, which again, 15 or 16 actually is more like what it is versus four. That's just an insane amount more. Capturing these is really easy though. You again want to use insulated tiles. If you have ceramic, that's the best thing to use, but we'll just use igneous rock since you'll probably find one of these pretty early if they happen to be on your map. And I'm going to build it something like this. Um, this is going to be pretty simple compared to the other ones. I will usually leave a ladder here so that if I need to go in there and maintain this for whatever reason, that I, I can still get there while only having to remove one tile. But you do want this to be totally sealed off. The gas that's in here uh, will eventually be a little bit of an annoyance. So what you can do for the first little while is just set up some airflow tiles like this so that all of the gas is eventually pushed out by the water. And then once the gas is pushed out, you can change these back to insulated tiles so that all that's in here is water and you're not getting any weird like pressure problems with the air and the high pressure of water that's in there. So once that's in there, I would grab a liquid pump. Again, be sure to make it out of something that can resist the temperature, so probably out of gold amalgam once again. I'm going to hook this up to another automation uh, bit, which is hydro sensor, which we've seen before. And I'm going to place it here so that we only pump this out if it starts to reach the second tile. And I'm going to say if it's ever above, say, like 100 kilograms or something like that. The behavior here, which we'll see, we'll demonstrate a little bit better than we did over here. The behavior here is just to make sure that we have an adequate amount of water and both to help push the gases out of there and to get this kind of sealed off nicely uh, before we start pumping it out. And that's pretty much it. So once you have those things set up, we're just going to hook up a line for water, which uh, made definitely a mess here. So we're going to have to <laughs> we're going to have to rebuild. I told you it was going to be messy. Rebuild some stuff here so we can pipe it. And there, this goes to our water drop-off point. And we need power, of course. If you ever seal these up, I would recommend sealing these up with this conductive wire so that you don't have to go back in there and replace it later. I'm just gonna be really messy with this because whatever. And there we go, you got yourself a water geyser. Much simpler than the other ones for sure, and definitely one of the best water sources in the game. Just to demonstrate this automation, since we didn't see it very well last time, let's go ahead and sample this and let's create water that's at the temperature that it says it comes out. And we'll create a lot so that this thing actually turns on. Uh, this ought to overdo it. So let's go ahead and brush it in. It will eventually expand because it's too much for that tile. Then you can see it start to push the air out a little bit uh, into these uh, airflow tiles. Let's add a little bit more. Maybe something like this. Once it gets full enough, it will push all the air out. It will activate this hydro sensor because we are above the requirements for this. And it will turn the pump on and start just pumping regular water out into your system. So there you go, basic water geyser. Let's keep going with a couple of other ones that are very, very similar. Let's go with a uh, saltwater geyser. This is probably gonna be another one that you find pretty early on. So this is going to be almost exactly the same as this, except for we're going to need to turn this into... Oh, by the way, we need to replace our tiles. So let's go ahead and destroy these ones. There we go. You eventually want to have it all sealed up looking something like this. Uh, let's talk about saltwater geysers. We will need to turn this into regular water, which means we'll have to desalinate it. There's a couple of different ways to do this. I'm just going to use the building because that's the most straightforward thing. But the setup here is exactly the same. So I usually put a ladder there. Hydro sensor, pump, but if I need to eventually purify this, which I'd probably do somewhere else, um, I would probably do it like more near where my actual water setup is, but we'll just ignore that for right now, just for the sake of speed. Uh, you'll want to grab one of these refinement uh, bits, drop a desalinator. I'm going to drop it actually kind of far away, just to demonstrate that you don't want to build it like on location. Some other stuff you can do here that's pretty handy is you could actually build some liquid reservoirs to store a little bit of the backup water, which we probably should have done here as well. Just so that if your water system ever has a lot of water in it or it's backed up for some reason that you're not wasting the potential water that you could get out of this geyser, just store it in one of these things 
and do something like this. Let's repipe this really fast just to kind of demonstrate the point. So what I would do is I would deconstruct this like that. I would run the pipes up into chambers like this, then run them back out like that. This will only be useful to serve as an overflow. Uh, this will make it so that, again, if your water system is ever backed up, this will uh, prevent that from becoming a problem. By the way, you want to make these out of something that can resist the hot water as well. So you definitely want to build these out of gold amalgam also, which is something that I should have checked, and I totally didn't. Whoops. Let's build these out of gold amalgam and do something like this. There you go. Now we still have the same amount of flow, but it will be serving as an overflow just in case. I have started to grow to really like building this stuff on location, by the way. Oh, let me place my other tiles here. Just to get the gas out. Because that's what we would do originally, so we can achieve a fully enclosed thing like this. If you enclose it with gas still in there, it won't actually look like this, or it won't fully solidify. Uh, and then let's place the right things here, which is made out of gold. Gold amalgam more specifically. Let's run it into the overflow and back out. And this is going to go out into my desalinator, which is then going to turn it into regular water. So let's just run it back out here. And we're making a huge mess, but, you know, that's just the name of the game. Huge mess simulator. And then we still need to hook up our automation like that. You can actually copy the settings from this as well so that it will only pump if it's over 100 kilograms. And then we can grab a wire for power and hook it up like that. There we go. Now we have basically the exact same setup, except for this one's salt water. It's going to be heading into a desalinator, which let's hook that up to power as well. This is getting very overloaded, so we'll just make a new one. And then the desalinator will turn that into regular water, which is then going to flow into this once again. All right, cool. Let's move on to a couple of other ones that are very similar to these ones that we've seen so far. Uh, those ones are going to be... Oh, I need to also wall this off so it doesn't make too much heat. Those are uh, going to be different types of water. Let's first talk about the polluted water vent, which again is going to look exactly the same as these guys, except for it's going to produce polluted water. And kind of critically, uh, this is going to be very germy polluted water for what that's worth. Oh, these guys open this up. What are you fools doing? These duplicates making a mess. Here, let's just destroy two of them. There you go. All right, so polluted water is going to be uh, producing polluted water with a lot of germs, but the capturing method is still exactly the same. By the way, the temperature that this comes out at, this one was at 203 Fahrenheit. Saltwater geyser is the same, or 95 Celsius. This one comes out at 86, which is very cold, or 30 degrees Celsius. By comparison, that's very cold, meaning that we won't need nearly as much cooling on this if we need to use it for other things, like our bristle blossoms, for example. But the capturing method is going to be exactly the same. Something like this. Again, leave the tiles. You can eventually get all of the oxygen out of there, and it'll eventually kind of overpressurize to look something like this. Drop the ladder. Drop the pump. Drop the hydro sensor. Hook it up. Copy the settings on the hydro sensor, which is here. We're going to add some liquid reservoirs. These ones don't necessarily need to be made out of gold because we're not dealing with as hot of a liquid this time. Might as well just start dropping new dev generators here just to not overload our lines too much. There we go. And insulate this. Just because whatever, you don't necessarily have to on these ones because it's not going to be that warm. But it still is a little bit warmer than I would want my base. Now this one's going to be producing polluted water. Uh, you need to actually clean this as well before you can use it most of the time. There are some plants and stuff that can take polluted water, or you could use it in like your cooling system or something like that. But just for the sake of completeness, let's go ahead and drop a water sieve. So I'd run this down into the sieve. What's going to come out of here, though, is going to be germy water. This is going to be still like water that looks like this, but it will have a lot of germs in it. So you'll probably want to pump that into a separate place than this because you typically will want to keep those separated. For example, if you were producing oxygen or if your dupes were drinking it or something like that, you don't want to have them drinking germy water. So I'm going to send this into a different tank. There we go. And then this one's going to need sand and all kinds of fancy stuff. 
Uh, I guess we'll put a duplicate out here so they can actually load it. Actually, even better, let's just be lazy and put an auto sweeper out here. And some sand. There we go. Alright, then once we get all this stuff hooked up, this will start putting out polluted water. You can see it has a lot of germs in it, by the way. Um, this is a silly amount of germs, which is why I have this separated from the rest of my sources. I just made a video on this, by the way, but uh, if you ever wanted to use your germy water for something, you can use it for a whole bunch of different sources. Uh, feeding it to your plants is one of the better ways, by the way. So that's what I would definitely recommend doing. Uh, so yeah. So we've got our polluted water vent. Uh, that one's pretty straightforward, I think. One of the better vents in the game, honestly. So definitely grab those guys if you can get your hands on them. Just for the sake of completeness, I'm going to have this uh, whole setup running, by the way. Let's go ahead and paint in some more polluted water here. Let's say we got it to this point where it was filling up to the point that there was no more oxygen or gas or whatever inside here. So then we can deconstruct these airflow tiles and reseal it with this. The reason I would want to reseal this also is because this will just gas off into polluted oxygen. So I will just eventually want to seal it entirely. But once we get flow, it's going to head into this uh, tank. If it can come out of the tank, it will come out. It'll go down into our water sieve. You can hook uh, two water sieves up to this if you really want to. Um, if you want to get it purified faster. But for the most part, uh, with all these water sources running, you shouldn't really need to. And that's another reason why these other sources can be handy, because we're starting to get backed up. But we're not wasting water, we're just having it sit here instead. So cool, now we're pumping this out. Once this gets here, oh, I need to destroy this other bit of polluted water that got in here. Once this gets here, we will see the difference between this. So this water is clean, it has no germs in it whatsoever. I could breathe this, I could uh, use this for drinking water, you could do all kinds of other stuff with it that would be very very nice. This is usually very hot water, by the way. You can see it chill in here at about 200 degrees Fahrenheit or 94 Celsius. This water, though, has germs in it. You can see it has slime lung germs, which is definitely what comes out of here, which is why you would not want to... Uh, well, not the vent. I want to see the water. Which is why you would definitely not want to produce oxygen off of something like this. Uh, otherwise, you're just going to get your whole colony exposed to slime lung on a daily basis, and that's a big problem. By the way, we can still check back to any of these other things to see what's going on. Uh, this setup's still lasting pretty good. This thing has not erupted for a little while. We're generating some more water here. Uh, we're kind of close to being ready to pump this out, but we have a, plenty of coolant here up in our pipes. And uh, yeah, these other things are still doing their job like they're supposed to, so we've got that. Let's move on to a cool slush geyser. Uh, this is one of my most favorite geysers in the whole game um, because it does two things. It gives you water, but it also gives you a lot of cooling. So if you check this guy out, the uh, temperature that this spawns at is 14 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 10 Celsius. This is so cold that if you were to send it through one of these water sieves, it would just freeze instantly in the pipes and it would break it. And uh, it would cause you to like spill ice on the ground and eventually melt and cause a big mess. You'd have to repair the pipes. So this is something that I think is very useful to put into your cooling network like this. Or you could have it cool other things. So for example, rather than running on a cooling loop from this water, I could just store this in its own tanks up here, which is, the setup is going to look exactly the same. We'll do that in a sec. But I could use that to cool this, for example, and not use for my main supply of cool water. And you kind of need to before you purify it anyway. So you need to find a way to warm this before you uh, send it into one of these water sieves. Uh, so that's that's definitely something to think about with these guys, but the cooling that you get off of is very cool uh, As in very interesting cool Totally did not mean to make that pun, but it happened. I'm just gonna send it in here for the time being. Oh Whoops, we left it on pause for too long uh, Whatever who cares? All right, let's go ahead and set this up as well again gonna use some insulated uh, pipe because or rather tile because I don't want it to be sharing the temperature with the stuff out here. If I have the power of cooling, I might as well harness it. So let's go ahead and set it up the exact same way. Just going to be cheating off my neighbors here. Set up an airflow tile or two. And for these polluted sources, by the way, you can put deodorizers on the top of here to clean the oxygen that might spawn from the water that's inside there. But yeah, let's go ahead and pull up these down. Throw a few tanks up, again, just as an overflow. Drop a pump in here. 
I like to drop a ladder. Again, if I need to access this, it's easy just to dig up this one tile. My dupes can just jump straight down there like that. And then again, the sensor to detect how much water is there. Hook that up. Copy the settings. And there you go. If you wanted to purify this, uh, you'd have to send it into a separate water sieve so that you don't mix up your sources. You want this to be clean water and you want this to be germy water. This is definitely putting out polluted water that is not germy. So uh, that can go straight into your drinking water if it does get warm enough or anything like that. So let's go ahead and set this up. And I'm just going to send this into my cooling area because that's something that can be very handy. There we go. And then we just need to hook this up to power and we're done. And that should set that up. So be creative with these things. There's a lot of good ways you can use this to cool different parts of your base down. Uh, you could cool down rooms that get too hot for your duplicates. You could cool down water with it, like if you need to cool water for bristle blossoms or something like that. This is one of the best vents in the game for a good reason. All right, let's move on to... I'm trying to decide what I want to do next here, looking at everything. Let's just get one of them out of the way that's really worthless. Um, this one is so bad that there's almost not even a setup for it because it's not something that you really need. Although it may change a little bit um, as we get into the uh, the DLC and stuff. That's going to be this carbon dioxide geyser. Oh, whoops, I just spawned the exact same thing. We want this. There we go. Carbon dioxide geyser produces carbon dioxide at negative 67 Fahrenheit or negative 55 Celsius. There are so many caveats to this that it's crazy. Um, this is hardly any carbon dioxide, so even if you wanted to use this for cooling or something like that, it's still not that good. Um, you can use carbon dioxide for a couple of things, like at least in the DLC now, you can use it for rocket fuel, so that's not the worst thing ever. But it will come out solid, meaning that you need to warm this in some way. So, honestly, if this were me, I would do this out of something really silly. Like, I would probably build this out of uh, metal tiles or airflow tiles or something like that, just to allow for some temperature exchange. And then just set it up with a pump. Looks something maybe like this. And then the pump that I want to have come out of here is the gas pump. Um, and then you can send it out. You can send it into tanks if you want to store it. If you just want to use it for cooling, you can just leave it here like this, or you can route it through some gas pipes to a place that you want cooling. But the cooling is going to be so bad, and you're going to be spending power to move this stuff around anyway that it's really not worth it. I say it's going to be so bad because the amount that spawns from this uh, polluted water geyser is like, you know, five times more. And carbon dioxide really does not impart a lot of energy onto other things. It's one of the worst in terms of, uh, like, heat transfer and that kind of stuff. So this is just not good overall. I'd say the only real usage this is going to be for is for rocket fuel in the DLC. But even then, you can already get carbon dioxide for free from your duplicates. So this one's, like, there's barely anything to do with this. And this is about as good as you can get. The whole idea behind this is that the carbon dioxide that comes out of here will be solid which means that it will melt and turn into liquid, which will eventually melt and turn into gas. Or I guess, uh, boil turning into gas rather than melting. But yeah, this is about the extent of this. There's not a whole lot of great uses for this. Um, you could also make this a little bit more efficient if you wanted to. You could set this up with an Atmos sensor, which you probably should actually now that I'm thinking about it. Set this up on a, no, we can even just do it without the buffer gate. Just set it up on a Matmos sensor so you're only running this gas pump when there's a reasonable amount to pump out. So maybe above like 500, no, not 5,000. Maybe above like 500 grams. Oh, something I should back up and talk about, by the way. Anything that produces liquid like this, they will start to overpressurize once their top tiles are at about 1,000 kilograms per tile, which is why I have this uh, hydro sensor here to make sure that we're pumping it out before it makes it so that it's like blocking the geysers. Here we go, we're pumping out some carbon dioxide. The tiles are so warm, and they will continue to get warmed by your surrounding base, uh, that it's really not that big of a deal. It will eventually just produce carbon dioxide here. For the sake of it, and because uh, the DLC is near, and I think that carbon dioxide will have more of a place. Whoa, I don't want to build it out of this. That's a dumb idea. Um, I would definitely recommend storing this in two containers if you want to use it. But considering in the base game anyway, that the typical use for carbon dioxide is just blowing it out into space. Uh, you definitely don't want to do that, otherwise there was no reason to set this up in the first place. 
So most of the time, I'll just leave this one alone. All right, so let's go ahead and store this here. And I guess it could go out to wherever you want it to, but for now, at least we'll store it. That could eventually go to your rockets or something like that. And there you go, getting some carbon dioxide. Nothing too special, but, you know, it's there. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much all I got for that one. And again, it's not a very worthwhile cooling solution. It is cool in some way, but you can see how, like, comparatively little resistance this is putting up to the temperature that's normally outside of here anyway. If this was, like, in the middle of your base, by the way, or if you had some hot buildings around it, it wouldn't be the worst cooling option also, so I guess I'll give it that, but most of the time it's just not worth the ventilation and the power that you spend on it. I'm just going to keep this cooled off, or sealed off, by the way. All right, what should we move on to next? Um, let's start talking about the gas vents here. Let me check out what we still have to go. We still have a lot to go. This is going to be a long video, guys. All right, well, we're going to try to speed run some of this. Let's talk about the carbon dioxide vent. So this is going to be kind of similar to what we just did, except for this is going to be one of those super hot ones. 932 Fahrenheit and 500 degrees Celsius. Um, I have found absolutely no reason to get one of these. So, I mean, unless you have a real reason for getting really crappy warming from something and spending the energy on that, you will also need to make your pump out of something that can resist the temperature, or you will need to cool it before you can pump it out. Cooling carbon dioxide seems like the most worthless thing in the world to do to me. So I I would really not worry about this. Uh, the only thing that you could probably get... Let me build this in a little better place, by the way. Um, that I still would not be super excited about is... You could use it for power. Because anything that produces something that's really hot, you can use for power. But this is just so impractical. And it's going to take so much effort for barely any payoff. So let's let's just do this real quick. This is also going to segue kind of nicely into some of the other things that I have to talk about. So, if you want to generate power from heat, what you'll want to do is build some metal tiles around something like this. And pretty much all the way around to about here. I would close this off with a mechanized airlock. Then I would surround this with an uh, insulated tile. So I'm going to do something like this. If you want to get really fancy, you could leave a gap here that's vacuumed out so there's absolutely no transfer, but that's not really necessary. On this layer, though, this layer is going to be a little bit different because this layer is going to be water that you will eventually boil with the heat of this carbon dioxide. This is, again, not very worthwhile. Just going to keep saying that. Um, what you would do once you got down to here is you need a vent to eventually vent this out. Now, this, this goes two folds. Uh, one, you're spending power to get rid of this. It's probably more power than you're actually going to generate. So, again, not real a big reason to do it. In fact, that pretty much just nullifies the whole setup, right? There's no reason to talk about this. All right. Don't get, don't get carbon dioxide vents. So here's what I would do if I found one in the wild. Uh, I, would, I would see, oh, it's a carbon dioxide vent, huh? All right. There, you captured it. All right, done. Let's move on to something that actually is more practical that I'll show what I was about to set up there, though. Hydrogen. All right, hydrogen vents are one of the best ones in the game. I'm going to set up the exact same way I was before, something like this. I'm going to cut off the excess and repurpose it for later batches. I'm going to use a mechanized airlock. You could also use, uh, what are they called? Temp shift plates in here if you really wanted to. You don't necessarily have to, though. Uh, I'll explain the rest of the setup, though. So what you're going to do is something like this. Carve out a little bit of space for your pump. And the first concern for this is that this is going to spawn at that really hot temperature once again, 932 degrees Fahrenheit or 500 Celsius. You definitely want this to uh, be cooled down before you start working with it, though. So you want to have access to steel, and that's going to be what's going to eventually pump this out. But you'll notice that steel can only resist up to 527 or 275 Celsius, which means we got to cool this before we can actually start using it. That's what this layer is for. This layer is for water. Uh, I should probably set this up for real, actually. So I'm going to leave an empty chamber here. I'm going to set up a gas pump that I don't care if it breaks later. That's fine. This is, again, just going to be to vacuum out the room. So I'd set up something like this on a high-pressure gas vent. I want to set this on some automation so I can turn it off once this is entirely vacuumed out. So let's say I run this for a little while, it turns into nothing but a vacuum, which is what I want. Let me go ahead and fill this with vacuum, which sounds really weird. There we go. Uh, 
How does a vacuum have germs? What's going on? All right, there we go. And then on top of this are going to be a couple, probably one or two steam turbines. I think one is probably just generous enough. So let's go ahead and just drop one for the sake of simplicity. It doesn't really matter where, so we'll just go ahead and drop it, I don't know, here. And then on this other side, you want to have a liquid vent that is sending water in from some source somewhere. Uh, you would normally have a source that makes a little bit more sense, but I'm just going to hook it up to something that's nearby. There. You'd want to let water run into here for a little while, and then you also want to have this on automation so you can shut it off when you have enough. The water here is going to act as a coolant for this hydrogen, but it's also going to heat up to the point that it turns into steam and give you a little bit of extra power on this steam turbine. From here, now we need to figure out what to actually do with this hydrogen. So let's continue to set this up here. I'm gonna hook this up to power. Oh, we need to worry about this door. Uh, this door needs to be on some kind of automation as well. I want to put this on an Atmos sensor so that I can make sure I have enough hydrogen for it to be worthwhile to open. And then I want to set it up on a thermo sensor to make sure that the hydrogen is cold enough before I start uh, actually venting it out. Hook these up to an AND gate. And I apologize for the speed that I'm doing this. I do talk about this a lot in my automation video. So if you feel like I'm going too fast, I would check that out. Uh, so what I would do is say, if this is anywhere below like three... 20, let's say Fahrenheit. This can resist, resist up to 527, and the steam will eventually regulate out to about 260 Fahrenheit, so somewhere in the neighborhood. Uh, you definitely want to figure out where that happy medium is. And then above like 1500 grams of hydrogen. Once those conditions are true, once we have enough hydrogen here and once it's cooled enough, this door will open so that we can actually pump it out and use it. Now this is going to go into a bunch of hydrogen generators, and that's the whole point of this, is to generate a lot of power. By the way, I need to turn this off. Come on, game. There we go. Need to turn this off so we're not venting any steam. But now we're starting to get water in here, and this water will eventually turn into steam. You don't need a tremendous amount, uh, especially because your goal here is to cool, and cool kind of rapidly. So I would say maybe like 200 kilograms, 300 kilograms of water, something like that is probably totally fine. So I just leave it like that. Um, and then the hydrogen needs to go somewhere, and there's a couple of different ways you can store this. Uh, one way you can store it is using a bunch of containers that just contain the hydrogen that will not cause you any extra power. So I'm just going to build a small little room like that for this. And you again need to make sure that this can resist the heat. Um, and this is one of the downsides of storing this this way, is that this hydrogen is going to be coming out at about 320 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, you probably need to build this out of steel, which is usually not super worthwhile. But if you decide to do it, it would just be something like this. Oh, wow, that was perfect. Totally not intentional. Probably just be something like this, where you just kind of send it in there and then send it back out when you want to use it. Or, instead of doing something like this, uh, you could just have it vent into another room that's nearby. Use a high-pressure gas vent like that. And then just pump it back out when you actually need it. Which again, you can put this on automation to make sure you're not wasting power pumping barely anything. You could put this a little bit more further in the middle of the room, by the way. Just so it doesn't get messed up from being right next to the pump. Maybe we only want to pump this out if it's above like 500 grams or something like that. Let's hook up some power to this. And then what this is going to lead into is a whole bunch of hydrogen uh, generators. And this is going to, going to produce a tremendous amount of power for you. So you're probably going to drop some hydrogen generators that look something like this. And yes, you can power this many with a vent like this. It gets pretty crazy. Uh, let's go ahead and just get rid of this. Move it somewhere else. Um, Sure, why not? Let's say we did something like this. Let's get rid of these extra power wires, by the way. Deconstruct. There we go. You could power a lot here. We also want to make sure we're not using it excessively. So you want to make sure that you're only using it when you actually need the power. So I would have a smart battery hooked up and have this all hook into a main power line uh, so that you know when you need to have power from this or not. And it looks something like this. You also do need to cool this room, by the way. This is going to generate a lot of heat. I'm not going to exhaustively go through this again, but I would use the exact same cooling solution as I did before. Um, just have a bunch of uh, radiant tiles in here with some hydrogen inside the room. 
You can also kind of leave this more open if you want to have the ability to get in there and perform some maintenance on it. So you could do something like this. Since so you could get up and down. And make sure to hook your uh, smart battery up to all these generators so that you are only using hydrogen when you actually need the power for it. Again, I have a separate power video, a separate automation video that talks about a lot of this kind of stuff. And I'm going fast just because uh, there's a lot to cover still. And this video is already really long. Uh, so let's go ahead and hook up all the hydrogen to all the different uh, sources or all the different power generators. And there you go. Outside of the cooling, this is pretty much done. But I would copy the exact same cooling setup that is here. Flood the room with hydrogen. Snake some pipes in here. You know, kind of like this. You can have it kind of jump over that, go down here, and that kind of stuff. Being very messy, but I think you get the idea if you were watching earlier in the video where you saw this setup to actually keep this room cool. So I do something like this. Uh, this setup is one of the best in the entire game. If you can get your hands on this, I would definitely do it. Um, another thing you can do is you can pre-vacuum this room out if you want to only have hydrogen. But you'll note that I built this up at the very top because... If there's only hydrogen in this room, it, or rather if there's other things in the room, the hydrogen will actually go to the top. The other things will go down to the bottom. And also, you don't need these things in here, by the way. So you could just have a room that looks something like this. So there you go, hydrogen vent. Let's talk about hot polluted oxygen. This is not something that I find overly interesting. So I'm going to speed run this a little bit. The setup for this would probably look exactly the same as here. Um, but then afterwards, if I wanted to use it as like breathable oxygen, I would need to further cool it using this cooling method that we have used up here. Um, this is not something I usually interact with only because it doesn't produce a lot and it doesn't produce a lot of power either. So there's not really a big reason to get this and there's just way more efficient things that you could do with, uh, to get oxygen from other places. So. I'm just going to do this one to this one as well. I, I wouldn't say it's worth it to really interact with this that much. Let's talk about an infectious polluted oxygen vent. This one is a little bit different. This one's a little bit more practical as well. It comes out at 140 or 60 degrees Celsius, which is a little hot. Um, so you can cool this if you really want to get the oxygen out of it, but it's still not a tremendous amount. So this is not one that I will typically use very often. Um, something that you can use it for, let me try to find some. So if you find, where are you? There's no puffs? What is this? Is this game trolling me? How have I not found a single puffed? What is going on? All right, well, I'm just gonna spawn one. And just pretend we found one here. Sure, why not? So if you find one of these guys, uh, you could potentially ranch these guys to produce slime for you, which can be useful for some farming things. It's not the most useful thing. You could use it just for meat as well. Um, so if you're using uh, one of these vents just to feed straight to these puffs, which is what they eat, is polluted oxygen, you could use that uh, just to help them. They could cool it down for you a little bit. Uh, we can check out the temperatures that they're comfortable in. It's still a little bit above that, but uh, it's not too bad. Uh, it's still not very practical. This is again one of those vents where I would see it and just be like, eh, it's not that great. I don't know. I'd, I'd probably just do something like this. Ranching puffs is also not overly economical either. Uh, they do require a little bit of maintenance and you need to have a consistent source of oxygen that you don't mind wasting, which is not great. So I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and say just wall that one up as well. All right, chlorine vent. Um, this is going to be a little bit different than a lot of what would typically be used for this, and I would also typically not in interact with this very much. But there are some instances in... Whoa, do I not have this captured? Oh, here we go. They're all... Are, uh, my capture of this must have been pretty bad. Let's go ahead and grab this one. Uh, selection. Let's grab you. Copy. And paste. There we go. So chlorine vents are not super interesting. There's not a whole lot you can do with this chlorine. Um, there is one thing that I have discovered, which this may help like one person someday in the future, or if you just want to be a silly goose, uh, this chlorine will come out at a reasonable temperature, 140, and we need to check on the thing that I want to plant here. The, the thing that you can use to actually suck this up is a uh, Dasha salt vine, which is not something I've ever talked about before on this channel, but it is pretty interesting. So I've done this once, um, only just to be silly, 
just because I have never played around with this before, but the Dasha salt vines are an interesting plant that produce salt. Um, we want to make sure to have a lot of space for this, by the way, or at least a lot of salt vines that can eat it up really quickly. So this is, again, why this is not super practical. But the salt vines are something that produces salt. And you might wonder what the point of that is. And the point is that you could produce oxygen using rust, which uh, does not spawn on this map. There are some biomes that spawn on some other maps that are made of rust, which you can use to generate oxygen from. So again, this is just to be just to be silly. Grab some of these. These are the seeds, by the way. We'll throw in some uh, auto sweepers. These do take sand to feed, by the way, so these are quite a bit of maintenance. So again, this is going to be yet another one that I would probably just wall off, but just for the sake of being silly, let's talk about this one. Maybe do something like this. You'd need a way for your duplicates to actually have access to this, so some kind of liquid lock would be a good way to do it. Um, I'm just going to build it really fast just to kind of demonstrate what the example would be. Whoops. And then grab some water. Something like this. So that the gases will not transfer from side to side. Your duplicates could come in here and work on stuff if they really needed to. Probably want some kind of automation for this, which is what these uh, auto sweepers are for. There we go. I am going to check back on these other setups, by the way, so that you can actually see them all in action. But then we go ahead and plant our salt vines, which do grow upside down, by the way. These are not turned upside down by accident. And once you throw these in there, these salt vines will uh, thrive in a certain temperature range. You may need to cool them a little bit or get a second source of chlorine, which is, again, why this is not super useful. Um, but they will go ahead and eat the chlorine. They will need sand as well, which we talked about. Uh, but you can grow it for something like this to produce oxygen via rust and salt, or if you really wanted the salt to improve your food quality. But realistically, and I'm just going to undo everything I just did because... What I would do most of the time with these things, whoa, gotta be careful, is again, another one of these. There. The other thing that you could potentially use chlorine for is for uh, sanitation, but you can usually get enough of that from bleachstone that you find around the map anyway, so yet another one I would realistically probably wall off. All right, let's get to a good one for once, not a bunch of these wasteful ones. All right, natural gas. This is one of the better ones in the game as well because of the amount of power that you can generate. So what I would do for this one, this one would spawn somewhere. Clear my selection. I want to grab an insulated tile around this because this is going to spawn it at 302 degrees Fahrenheit or 150 Celsius, which is very hot. But this is going to basically be one that I just want to pump it out and use it right away. Or store it and then use it. So the size of this is very deliberate. I would use a gas pump and I would want to make sure that I build this out of steel. Um, only because that's like the only thing that can resist this kind of heat. Gold amalgam will not be able to handle this. So you'll have to wait until you have steel to use this uh, practically. And then I also want to make sure that I have enough uh, gas in here for this to actually be worthwhile. So I will set up a gas sensor, something like this. You can also set it on a buffer gate if you want to make sure that it runs for a little bit after you get up to a certain uh, level, so you're not constantly throttling this on and off. Probably want to set this to anywhere above 1500 grams, so it needs to be fairly saturated with natural gas and not too high because, again, this will get backed up if there's too much in here. And I'll set this for, I don't know, 10 seconds, so that once we detect it at 1500 grams or more, this will turn on for at least 10 seconds and continue to pump it out power for this. Let's go ahead and just hook it up. Nothing special. Oh, it built through the Neutronium. Lol. And then the actual ventilation will need to go somewhere. Uh, I typically like to just pump this into its own room as well. So you could do something like this. And then just send it in there with a high pressure gas vent. You might note that uh, it's probably better to vacuum this out first before you start actually harvesting any of this natural gas, just so you can ensure you're only getting natural gas through there. But the natural gas will eventually pool up in here, something like this. And then uh, we want to set up a gas pump. You could vacuum this whole room out once again. Let's just go ahead and pretend that we did that. If you didn't, you'd have to filter it after it came out to make sure that it's sending the right stuff to your generators. Which, uh, we're having a hard time getting everything all at once. 
No, I messed up the tiles. That can happen if you click on them. It'll be okay. They'll just look really bright. But once you have that set up, you can set up some insulated gas pipes to go up to your natural gas generators, which are very strong. This is like the second... Oh, did I actually mess this up super hard? Hmm. Let's just build it somewhere else. Which are like the second power source that you will have uh, in your game. It'll usually be... Or I guess third. It'll usually be uh, manual power, and then coal, and then natural gas. You probably set up, I don't know, something like this. And again, you'll want to set it up on a smart battery, just so that you're only using the natural gas when you actually need it for power, meaning that your batteries are low. So I'd set up a smart battery. I'd hook it up to my automation like this. And then I'd hook it up to my main power network. Something like this. Which again, they should all basically be going to the same places. There we go. Let's hook up the automation. Oh, we already did. Then from here, you'll want to still use insulated pipes because this is still going to be very hot. Send it into the machine, something like this. These are also going to produce carbon dioxide, and they are also going to produce um, polluted water, so you'll need a way to handle that. But I'm not going to show that too much, because I do talk about this in the power video already, if you wanted to check that out. Since this is carbon dioxide that's coming out of here, I'll just pump it into here, since that might be useful in the future. But yeah, it'll look something like this. So once you get enough natural gas in here, this Atmos sensor will eventually... Uh, oh, man. What's happening with this if I do this, which is so annoying. Um, I'm just gonna have to deconstruct all this, which is, oh, I hate this. If you accidentally click on something to saturate it with gas and you click on tiles, it like makes the tiles there, but like not there. It's really annoying. So I'll just rebuild this really fast. Which probably should have done in the first place. Fortunately, we can see exactly where we were. And we'll be super sloppy, there you go. So it'll look something like this. Again, you need power to run in here, so here you go. And once you eventually get enough, which you could probably also put this again on another Atmos sensor to make sure that it is dense enough before you start actually pumping it out. Um, once you get enough, you can send it over to your natural gas generators. And since I did not actually filter this, this will start to damage these things a little bit. But I think you get the idea. Let's just sample this real fast. Or sorry, let's just fill this with the vacuum. Get rid of all this chlorine. Hopefully that'll help it stabilize a little bit. I mean, not click on the tiles like I did last time and mess everything up. Probably want to set this above, I don't know. Maybe a thousand's okay. Then you can see these things generating some power. This battery's getting filled up a little bit. It is producing some uh, polluted water, which you can then catch somewhere and reintroduce into your system or something like that. It's not a tremendous amount, but it's enough to at least be annoying. But yeah, there you go. Natural gas geyser. You'll usually spawn with anywhere between like two or four on any given map. Um, and these are very handy for a mid-game power solution. All right, are we on to volcanoes yet? Is there anything else to talk about? Let's talk about the leaky oil fissure, by the way. Um, actually, it's something that's not listed here, which is kind of weird. Let's talk about oil wells. Um, oil wells and leaky oil fissures are gonna be kind of similar. You'll find these in the oil biome. And this is also something that's not super complicated to set up, uh, but it is, well, I guess that's a lie. It's a little complicated. Let's get into it. So these things you will actually need a special building to harvest from. You'll need an oil well, which will look something like that. This will take in uh, a liquid, by the way. You have to spend water to get oil out of this. So you could use germy water on this as well. It's definitely a good source for that. So let's go ahead and hook it up to the germy water. Because it won't care what kind of uh, germs it has inside the oil. Or rather, it won't care what kind of germs it has inside the water in order to still work. So you hook it up to something like this. You should also note this is going to generate a lot of heat, and it's going to generate hot oil. So you definitely don't want to have this sitting out in your base. So I'd probably do something like this to kind of encase this. There you go. You'll need to also use a liquid lock like we used before that I think I deleted. So let's just pretend that we have a good setup for something like that. And then duplicates will need to enter this using suits. So I'd probably create something like this so they can maintain some stuff around it. There we go. They will need to enter this kind of frequently because what happens with this oil well is that it will build up some pressure of natural gas, which is gonna necessitate a bunch of other stuff with this. So we'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, let's see, get some water here. There we go. 
And then uh, at the bottom, or rather, let's start getting some flow from this. Do we have power? No. Getting lazy, getting quick. All right, there we go. So now we're sending this germy water down, sending it into our oil well. What will eventually happen? Oh, we need power here too. What will eventually happen is it will start producing oil from the water that it's consuming. And it will create that oil and just kind of have it fall down, which is why I have these mesh tiles here, so that it just kind of falls down into this bottom area. You could then pump it out and use it. But again, you need to make something that's going to be able to resist this. We are now producing oil now that we are pumping water into this thing. But I don't want to just pump this out immediately. I probably want to let this build up just a little bit. And that's because it's going to be useful to help cool this room down a little bit, which sounds kind of funny because it's producing at a pretty high temperature anyway. But what's building up inside here is natural gas that's very, very hot that duplicants will need to come release every once in a while. So what I'll probably do is I will just uh, let this thing build up quite a bit by having a hydro sensor that will limit the functionality of my pump until this thing gets saturated enough with oil. So anywhere above, let's say like 500 uh, kilograms. Let's hook this up to power two. And this output, uh, we'll just dump it into another chamber really fast just to kind of demonstrate the example. I'm going to go back and review all these, by the way, just so you can see them all functioning the way that they're intended to function. The other thing is the natural gas that's coming out of here also can be used for power. So I want to set up something made out of probably gold amalgam. I don't think you need anything that's too crazy. And set it up something like this. I also want to make sure that I'm only pumping it out when it is cool enough because I don't want to be pumping out super duper hot uh, natural gas. And I will probably use an Atmos sensor as well to make sure we have enough backup here. And set these to an AND gate. There we go. And we need a little bit of power for this. Make sure to set up our settings here. Probably wait until this is pretty saturated, maybe like 2,000 grams. And I want to make sure this is pretty cool. So like, I don't know, 200, maybe not that much, maybe 220 something like that. One thing that can happen here, and why you might want to build a little bit more stuff inside here to help absorb temperature, is that if all of this natural gas is released all at the same time, it could potentially overheat and break this gas pump. So what you can do to help this out just a little bit and help this cool a little bit is you can set up these temp shift plates to help share the temperature from uh, sand cement. What is that? Never seen that before. Brick. There's all kinds of new, cool new stuff in here. So probably set up something that looks maybe a little bit like this. This can take a while to build, but the whole idea here is that this kind of acts as a buffer for when this natural gas comes out to not immediately overheat your pump. You could also just build this out of steel, but I don't want to build things out of steel unless I absolutely have to. And since this is going to be putting out natural gas, I'm just going to dump it straight into the same place that all this is going which is going to be my room to store natural gas, which is eventually going to go into my natural gas generators. So oil wells, yeah, going to look something like this. Nothing too crazy, but also pretty interesting and pretty new if you haven't seen it before. So yeah, let's move on to the leaky oil fissure. Um, I've talked about this a little bit before, ironically enough, in my walkthrough videos because it just happened to spawn on that map. This is something that I don't really like that much, uh, mostly because you're not going to get a lot of power off of it uh, by comparison. You have to cool it if you're going to use it. The one thing you could use it for is for uh, converting into petroleum because it'll already come out really, really hot. If you look at actual oil, you can see that its boiling point is about 750 Fahrenheit and this comes out at about 620, so it's pretty close. In Celsius, they're separated by like 75 degrees, so they're pretty close. Um, so if you want to heat it up into petroleum and then cool it back down so that you can use it as petroleum, you can do that. That's pretty advanced for uh, this type of video. So if you're not sure about these things, honestly, one of the easiest things is just to seal it off. Something that I did do in my uh, other walkthrough video, though, which I'm just going to kind of replicate this build really quick. If you want to do something like this is you can create something that looks a lot like uh, this setup, which by the way, this is working. We will come back and look at this in just a sec. You want to create something that's going to encourage heat transfer into, into some water. And then that water is going to be sucked up by uh, some steam turbines. It's not going to be a lot, but uh, if you want to cool it down, that's one of the best ways to do it. So I'd probably do something like this. 
And uh, looks like we need to actually destroy this, which is fine because we're not using it anyway. Goodbye. Set up a steam turbine like this. We'd set up the same mechanisms that we would for this area. You want to vacuum it out and you want to eventually introduce water. Because I already talked about that here and because you can kind of see the idea, you want to vacuum it out first and then introduce water afterwards and eventually turn it off once you have enough water. You want to do the same thing here. I'm just going to skip uh, a lot of that nuance just because this is not a very common uh, vent type that you want to really be interacting with all that much. So you do something like this. Let's go ahead and brush in some water. There we go. You want to do the same thing as far as cooling that's up here, by the way. So if you can flood it with hydrogen and snake some pipes through to be able to keep this thing cool, that would also be a good idea. So I'm just going to kind of speed run that as well. Maybe 10. There we go. This is also going to produce water, but instead of sending it somewhere else, I'm just going to send it right back into the same chamber. And then the cooling on here, like we talked about before, sit some cold water in here until it gets too warm. Have it set out by a liquid shutoff and just hook it back into your cooling network. I'm not going to hook this up all the way because I did already talk about this earlier. So you can go back to the steam vent portion if you want to learn how to hook that up. As for this bottom area, I want this to share its temperature with this cool with this steam or with this water until the oil is cool enough for me to pump it out safely. So I could pump it out with a either something made out of gold amalgam, which can resist up. No, that won't be good enough. It needs to be steel. Uh, and then once you have steel, you can send this out over into the same area, which again, we want to be using insulated pipes because this is going to be very hot. But we only want this door to open if the uh, area is at least filled up with oil enough and is cooled enough. So uh, I'm going to be setting those two things up. Let's set this up on a AND gate. There we go. And I want to pump this out or at least open this door to let it fall down into here when it's at a temperature that will not damage my pump. So this gets damaged at about 527, which you can translate that into Celsius here. I'd probably do this if it was anywhere below, say, like 400 or something like that, just to be safe. We also want to make sure we actually have oil in here, so maybe like 150 kilograms or something like that. This will cause the door to open whenever that time comes. Um, and when there's enough oil in here, it will just drop it down into the bottom chamber, and then it will pump it back out. So again, being very lazy about a lot of this stuff. Let's go ahead and spawn some oil in there so we can actually see what this will do. There, so this should be like, oh, this oil is cold enough because it would have theoretically been cooled by this water, which was sharing its temperature with these metal tiles. It'll open it up, it'll dump it in there, and then it'll close it again once we have enough. So there you go. It'll look something like this. Simple way to harvest oil. You could also, I'm not going to show this part, but you could uh, have this running into like a volcano or something like that to transfer or turn this into petroleum which will be a better refining method than just the regular refining method, only because you get more petroleum out of it, but that's really not essential to succeed in the game, so I'm not going to talk about that too much. All right, so we've covered oil. The last things we need to talk about are volcanoes. There's a couple of different volcanoes, by the way. Whoops. Um, and I'm going to only spawn the minor volcano. Uh, there's Actually, I'll, I'll spawn both of them really quickly just so we can see the, the, two, the difference between the two of them. Whoops. There we go. Here's what a volcano looks like when it's been unearthed. Uh, and we're going to talk about this one, which is like the rock one, which puts out magma. And we'll talk about the metal ones afterwards. And then I think that's it. Just checking through my list here really fast. Yeah, I, th I think that's it. And this is only going to be for the ones in the base game, by the way, guys. So if you notice that I haven't covered some stuff that you're seeing in the DLC, that's because the DLC has not come anywhere close to stabilizing yet. So there's probably going to be new stuff or changes by the time that you see this, if it's like a month after this was recorded, I bet you that it will be different in the DLC anyway. So for these minor volcanoes and for the regular volcanoes, let me spawn one of those too. I think it's this one because I kept messing up the template. Oh no, okay, there we go. <laughs> They'll spawn magma, as you can tell. Uh, let's get rid of this. There we go. The only difference between the volcano and the minor volcano is the amount that they actually produce. 
So this one will produce 108, 138 kilograms per second of magma. This one will produce 271. So it's just a little bit more, maybe about double. Um, so the way that I talk about these things is one of two ways. You can use this if you ever want to boil something. So if you ever wanted to boil this crude oil and turn it into petroleum, you could use one of these volcanoes to do something like that. Uh, if you wanted to boil it even further and turn it into sour gas, you could do that, which I talk about a little bit in my uh, power tutorial video, but that's very advanced. What I like to do with these, and especially for beginner players, is not worry about all the fancy magma applications. Okay, that cooled down. Is instead just use this for some power every once in a while. Uh, it's a very safe way to do it. So what I would do is I would expect this to have a bunch of uh, steam turbines above it. And I would just have this sitting in some uh, water. So what I will do is I'll set up something maybe like this. I'm not exactly sure how wide this needs to be, so we might need to correct it. For the minor volcanoes, uh, you probably want, I would say, three or four steam turbines. And for the uh, regular volcanoes, obviously more than that, because it's going to produce a lot more magma and a lot more heat. So I would probably do something like this. Grab my steam turbines. Uh, we'll put four here just to be safe. And the worst eruption is always going to be the first one because the first one is going to be the one that might potentially uh, melt some stuff that's around it or damage some stuff or, or something like that. That is something you really need to pay attention to. So notice that I'm building this out of ceramic on purpose because the melting point is going to be a little bit higher than what the magma is coming out at. Let's take a look at this. Select the volcano. Oh, I'm on the wrong one. 3,100 degrees Fahrenheit, whereas the ceramic can resist up to 3,300. If you were to make this out of igneous rock, you'd probably melt through on the first eruption, and that would be really bad. So you need to pay attention to what type of tiles you're using on this, and ceramic is definitely what I would recommend. Another thing you can do, which I've recommended before in order to help ease the pain a little bit, is to create some temp shift plates. If you were to make this out of igneous rock, that would be good, um, only because it doesn't really matter if the first ones melt. It'll eventually just be kind of a buffer for the other stuff that you're going to have in this room. There's some other stuff you could use in here as well. Obsidian is a really good option because that has a really high melting point also. 4,900 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you have a lot of obsidian, that's a pretty good option. I'm just going to drop a bunch of obsidian here like this. Um, and then the, we eventually need to vacuum this out. So I'm going to say what I said before about vacuuming out chambers like this. Use a gas pump. It's eventually going to break and that's okay. So we would vacuum this out, set it out into a high pressure gas vent just to make sure it can vent. Set it up on some automation, like so. And as far as actually uh, these steam turbines, you could put this on a smart battery to make sure you're only using the heat that you want when it's time for these things to run. So you could put them on a smart battery. I usually don't, um, but if you want to be like really interested in being as efficient as you possibly can, then that works too. I would also send in uh, water for this, but you need to be careful about the quantity of water that you put in here. These will overpressurize if the air or gas or whatever around it is pressurized to anywhere above 150 kilograms per tile. So because this is four tiles tall, I would not put any more than 600 kilograms of water per tile here and probably give a little bit of buffer. Maybe tone that down to like 500 or maybe even 450. So I'm going to brush, or let's fill this up with a uh, vacuum first. Let's just pretend that we vacuumed everything else out, which you definitely want if you're working with steam turbines. Let's turn this off. And then the water that I would want in here, again, we don't want a lot. Let's say uh, 500 kilograms. You can extrapolate that out by how many tiles will be in the ones that are above it once it all turns into steam. So, you know, like 125 per tile or something like that. Um, you also do want to give a little bit of a buffer because uh, the water will still come down here and will be returned by these steam turbines. So let's uh, do that really fast. So I'm going to grab some pipe, run it back into this exact same thing. And uh, I could also put this on its own because I don't want to keep filling this up with water. So I might as well do that. Let's deconstruct these so that I can put this on automation and stop the flow of water once I know that I have enough in here. Like that. And then again, same cooling setup as there was before. Uh, flood this with hydrogen if you can get it. Uh, snake some pipes in here, which I'll just do for real because this is a little bit more precarious situation. Uh, you can snake them in any manner that you really want to, but you kind of want to be 
uh, spreading them out a little bit evenly because once this erupts, these are all going to be operating at full power. It's going to be generating a lot of heat. Probably just do something like this. Whoops, we want to have this be insulated. Uh, I totally did this wrong. We need to make sure that we have a place for this to go out. So we want to have this go out maybe here. Okay, no, this is fine. This is where it would go out. It would need to come in down here. And we'll just throw up our bridges really fast, just because we're being really pedantic about this. And I kind of want to see this one running as well. Or we can just simulate it because the vac- or the vacuum. The volcano doesn't erupt for really long times, so they're only active for like 65 cycles every 9,000 cycles, and you can see how long that is in cycles right here once you have it researched. Uh, but yeah, it can take quite a bit of time. Let's deconstruct this. Let's set up a heavy watt plate. And there we go. We have it hooked up to some batteries. All right. Now we need to hook this up to heavy watt wire. We also need to use this shutoff to make sure that we are flushing the room whenever it gets too hot. So once again, thermo sensor, buffer gate. This room's pretty big, by the way, so you want to put a little bit more uh, time on this. Let's say like 75 seconds. There we go. It looks something like this. Let's get some power over here real quick, which once they turn on, it'll be fine. Let's just fill this with hydrogen, which we would normally have anyway. Probably from like our oxygen producing setup, but yeah. Put a lot in there, there we go. So it's eventually gonna look something like this. And like I said, the first eruption is gonna be the worst one because that's when the most magma comes out and you're kind of least stable on this setup. Once that first eruption happens and once everything stabilizes, you're pretty good. Something that I've had to do, to do in here every once in a while is I've had to put a robo miner kind of nearby, and you want it to be a little bit far away so it doesn't break. Build this out of steel, by the way. And this is just so that in case something hardens and turns into like a solid tile, it doesn't mess up your setup. So I'll usually do something like this and hook this up to power just to make sure that I don't get stuck and that this thing can't produce. Because if you ever have to open this up back up, um, it's a real pain. So I'd probably put something like this. This will also matter in the other volcanoes as well. Um, but yeah, this is about what I would do. Let's just simulate this thing erupting here really fast. So let me go ahead and say magma. We also need to figure out how much this is going to produce. So 138 kilograms for 65 seconds. I'm going to do some really gross math here. Um, let's see. Let's just guess. I've seen about this number before. But let's say like uh, 10... Or sorry... This is going to be 10 tons. So let's just spawn a tile that looks like this and see what happens. So what will happen is as soon as this erupts, this is 9,999 kilograms of magma, by the way. This is about on point for minor and regular volcanoes. This is a decent example. What will happen is as soon as I unpause, it will flash boil this really quickly. Sometimes it might harden, like I said there. So you want to have this thing dig it out. But eventually it will stabilize and it will produce a ton of heat because we flash boiled all that water. And you can see this stuff running here right now. Something that may happen on your first time too is you may get something like this. It may really collect up here on the sides until all of this turns into steam. By the way, our gas pump's gonna overheat. Well, that's okay. It's done its job. We don't care anymore. Um, yeah, so that's roughly what a volcano is gonna look like when it first erupts. And again, the only difference between this and a regular volcano is that the regular volcano will produce more magma, so you probably want to have more steam turbines connected to it. Okay, let's move on to our last set of things, and that's going to be metal volcanoes. Now, I'm only going to show one because they all operate pretty much the same way. By the way, I'm also going to mention uh, once again that just because these are set up a certain way for cooling, there are better ways to cool this using steam turbines and volcanoes and stuff like that. So if you want to look up uh, different ways to do that, you're more than welcome to. I'm just trying to keep this simple for uh, newer players. Is this overpressurized? No. Uh, we'll hook up the... Do I want to hook up the cooling for this? 
I guess so. I guess we might as well. Jeez. There we go. Here's our input. Whoops. We missed, but that's okay. There. All right, we can check back on this for cooling later. All right, so I'm going to spawn an iron volcano. Um, the iron volcano and copper volcano and uh, the gold volcano are all pretty much the same. They just produce different metals. Uh, this is another one that I must have messed up or something like that because it's looking weird when I'm trying to spawn it. Uh, but yeah, so these, these are all pretty much the same. I'm only going to show one because you're going to set these all up pretty much the exact same way. So what I would do with these is the exact same thing that I'm doing on the interior here, but you don't need as much cooling. Maybe two turbines worth. And I'm going to not set up the cooling for this again, only because uh, we've seen it done a couple times now. There we go. This also doesn't produce as much material, by the way, so you can see it's significantly less magma, or significantly less, I guess, material. <laughs> I don't know how else to say that. Uh, so yeah, you also want to pay attention to what you put here as well, but it's not as big of a deal as the uh, as the volcanoes because it doesn't produce as much. You're usually okay with ceramic here, uh, but there is a small chance it could melt, especially if it got out of control. So something to keep in mind. I'm also going to drop a bunch of temp shift plates here just to help share the temperature a little. Oh, there was somebody saying, and if this was if this was you telling me about this to not actually build the temperature shift plates right up against the tiles here. I didn't know that. Um, I'm not sure why, so I'm just going to continue to ignorantly do it. If you're the person that talked to me about that, please leave a comment down there and explain. Or I don't remember if I'm correct or not, so let me know if that's actually the case. Uh, okay, so we're going to have something like this. We're going to still use the same gas pump to vacuum this out. You always want to do that, so I'm just going to pretend we did that already. Vacuum. You want to fill it up with water. Again, not too much. So about 500 per tile here, if you have it four tall, to make sure that we don't overpressurize the room. So let's just pretend we did that. I'm just going to put in steam for the time being, just to assume that we've already done that work. You want to send your water from the steam turbines right back into the same room. So there we go. Now this is a little bit different because the material that's in here, we don't really care about. I don't think we have a need for igneous rock that's at 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'm going to leave that alone, but this one's going to be a little bit different. Um, I'm going to build an auto sweeper in here out of steel, kind of far away, but still close enough that I can grab the material if I want to. I'm also going to build a conveyor loader in here out of steel, just so I can ship the metal out. Cause that's one of the better reasons to have something like this. As far as power is concerned, this is not going to produce a lot, but the metal that it produces is really worthwhile because you just basically get refined metal for free. So if you need to make steel or use it for whatever else you might need to use out in space or something like that, this can be really useful. So I'm going to have this just accept everything. And I'm only going to turn this on when I want it to be on. I'm not going to have it on all the time so I can let it cool a little bit before I actually ship it out. So I do something like this and I would turn it off and then only turn it on when I actually need it. But the tricky thing about this is that this is going to be producing really hot iron. And even if I let it cool down because it exchanges its heat with the steam, um, I still want to cool this down. So I'd probably have a separate pipe, or a separate pipe, a separate pool of water here that's filled with like, I don't know, polluted water or something like that. You could use it from your same cooling network, or you could actually use it from this guy up here, this cool slush geyser. But yeah, I would drop something down here. You could lower the temperature if you really wanted to. And you need enough water here to be able to just snake some pipes, or rather snake some conveyor lines through. So do something like this. And we'll force this one to erupt as well, just so you can see what this is like. And I'll have this just dump out, I don't know, here. So, we have this set up. We need to connect some power wires here, just so these will actually function. Like I said, we're not going to worry about uh, cooling these too much, so I'm just going to go ahead and close this off and just flood it with hydrogen for the time being. All right, there we go. So let's go ahead and spawn some iron and then we'll let it cool for a little bit and I'll show you how the rest of the cooling works with this. But it's pretty straightforward. Basically this water is gonna heat up 
Um, and then once you don't want this water anymore, you can just pump it out with a liquid pump whenever it gets too warm, or you could do it manually or something like that. I'll just skip that part for the sake of time. Let's see how much this is going to produce. Um, one lesson, by the way, don't ever do math on stream. That's a bad idea. Uh, so I'm just going to guess on this. I'm going to say this will probably produce about five tons of iron per eruption. Not a lot. Wait, that's not five tons. <laughs> don't do math on stream, people. Uh, let's just guess and say this is, we know this is not, like, it's about 350 tons, let's say that. Promise, it is, it is very hard to do math on stream. Alright, 350, wait, this is 350 kilograms. I am doing something wrong here. I think it's 350 kilograms and not tons. All right. So this is a long video, guys. An hour and 40 minutes straight of just talking. All right, we're gonna make mistakes. Here we go. So once this comes out, the iron is going to cool. It's going to heat up the steam. Once the steam gets hot enough, it will activate these steam turbines, but it may take a little while. So you can kind of see that not a lot happens here, but I don't want to ship out this iron until it gets more cool. So I might just let this sit for a little while, or I might let this go dormant. Let's just go ahead and speed this up to a temperature that I feel a little bit more comfortable about shipping this out. I'll usually ship it out when it's at least under like a thousand degrees Fahrenheit or maybe like 800 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. So I'll just fast forward to that point so that we can see it get cooled off the rest of the way. All right, this is probably pretty close, so let's call this good. All right. So what I would do is I would turn this on. This is going to enable this auto sweeper to actually pick it up. It'll load it inside this conveyor loader. You could turn it off immediately afterward if you wanted to, um, which I often will do. And then as it's traveling through the uh, polluted water, you can see it cooling down quite a bit. It's already at 200 degrees Fahrenheit, down to 100. I don't want to ship out the thousand degree iron straight into my base, but by the time it gets out there, if it's down to where it is right now, which is about 98 Fahrenheit, that's not bad. 37 Celsius, it's kind of a warm day. Uh, that's good enough. So that's a good metal volcano setup. All right, let me make sure that I talked about everything here. I'm just gonna scroll over to my list and make sure. Yeah, I think we're good. So this I think is every vent in the base game anyway and how you could use it. Let's take a look at their statuses after running for a little while. They've all been set up for about seven or eight cycles. Let's see what they're up to. So. This is producing water. This hydro sensor is activating this pump if it ever gets filled up enough. So every once in a while, it'll just pop out a little bit of water. Steam vent doing more of the same thing, just uh, producing some steam so we can get some power off of it. Any excess water is being pumped out here, so that's great. Regular water geyser filled up with water. Hydro sensor is doing its job, pumping it out whenever it gets too full. Saltwater geyser hasn't activated quite yet, hasn't filled everything up quite yet, but it's getting there. Um, once it gets there, like I talked about before, you will want to replace these tiles with just stuff that in totally encloses it. I'm also just going to make this a vacuum for the time being and pretend this is already got done. There we go. Then once it fills up all the way, it'll start pumping it out. It'll get sent down into our desalinator, which is here, and then over into our main chamber of water. Just in this amount of time, look how much water has actually been pumped in here. We did cheat in a couple areas, but it does produce quite a bit. Same thing with the polluted water vent. Uh, we have that going into its own water sieve, or water sieve, which it's already used up all the sand, by the way. Cool slush geyser we have going back into our main cooling network, so there you go. We have our natural gas geyser producing a lot of natural gas, and all just kind of chill in here until we get it over into the actual machines that are going to produce power for us. So looking something like this. Again, only pumping out every once in a while to make sure that uh, we're only pumping it out once we get to a high enough uh, pressure. By the way, if this were connected into its own room, you wouldn't necessarily need this. I only have this set up so that if you need to have it pump across the map, which is much more common than something like this, uh, then it's a little bit easier. Also, this will allow me to grab uh, natural gas out of here at a higher pressure overall. Because otherwise, if this ever got filled up to 5 kilograms, this would no longer work. 
All right, hydrogen setup. We have not actually seen this in action yet. That's because we don't have anything hooked up the right way. All right, so the hydrogen is coming out of here at 932 degrees Fahrenheit. It's being cooled by this steam and by these metal tiles. When it's cold enough and when it's dense enough, it's opening this door so that it can be pumped out by this gas pump. It's gonna be sent into a separate room and then eventually pumped into all the hydrogen generators that are gonna produce a lot of power for us. We don't actually have things that are using power right now, so it's gonna not look like it's that much, but it produces a lot. Here's our oil well running. We have yet to actually need to empty it because it has a emptying threshold of 75 and a duplicate has not come in here yet. So let's just go ahead and spawn one and make them do it. And we'll just delete it real quick. Well, that's not a duplicate. Go, duplicate, go! You will want to have this duplicate in a suit, by the way, because if you don't, you can see what happens. All right, Ada, get out of there. Run, run, run! All right, you made it. Good job. Now get deleted. Yeah, so you can see us releasing the natural gas. A um, little bit too lazy to set up uh, suits, but you kind of get the idea there. Producing oil for us and using the temp shift plates to cool the natural gas that comes out of here, so it's already down to a pretty reasonable temperature. Uh, a bunch of other vents are all closed off because they are not very good, so yeah, that's how little I recommend for that. Leaky oil fissure is erupting. It's being cooled by the uh, tiles that are here and the water that's connected to those tiles, so that's good. Got our volcano going on over here, still producing a little bit of power off of it. You again could use this for a lot of other purposes if you wanted to mess around with boiling uh, oil into petroleum. Same thing goes with our metal volcano. It looks like it has erupted again since then, so I might check the temperature of this. Okay, it's down pretty low, about 200 degrees. So let's go ahead and pump it back out, or rather sweep it out, that is. And turn that back off. Now that I'm done with it, it's gonna cool in the water, it's gonna drop out. So uh, the only thing that we have not talked about additionally is this carbon dioxide geyser. So these are filled with a whole lot of carbon dioxide at a pretty low temperature, but again, this is not the greatest thing ever. I guess for rocket fuel it could be, but this is like an excessive amount of carbon dioxide. Most of the time I would just vent my carbon dioxide into space, so this is not really all that uh, interesting to me, so yeah. Uh, let's see, that's pretty much it. I think that's everything that we have set up. That should be every geyser in the game. I'm double and triple checking my list here to make sure that I didn't mess anything up, and I think that I got everything. So, yeah, that's what I got. Uh, please leave any comments down below if you have any particular questions about any of these setups. Uh, this is, again, not the most hyper-optimized way to do everything. There are better ways to do that, but I don't want to trip up new players with very complicated setups. Um, so, yeah, if you guys have any other ideas for things, definitely post them down there if you've got them, if other players will be able to benefit from that. So that's one of the better things about having videos and having a community like this. So yeah, I appreciate you guys watching. Uh, stay tuned for more videos, more tutorials, all kinds of fun stuff soon. I'll see you then. Have a good one.